By the way, there are people in the back. There's at least five seats here. So if you want to make your way to the front on this side, there are five or six, maybe five seats available. Uh, good evening, everybody. It, uh, it gives me great pleasure to be here. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, very briefly, I'd like to introduce our panel before we show you an exclusive uh, six-minute video about the, the project. Um, so as you know, the UAE is uh, working on a project to uh, launch a probe to Mars known as the HOPE probe. And uh, the idea is for the probe to launch uh, in 2020, and we'll ask the panelists why 2020, uh, for the 50th anniversary of the founding of the UAE. And to learn more about uh, this project, we have uh, three of the over 70 Oli Marathi team of uh, the Mohammed bin Rashid Space Center here in Dubai. Uh, we have Saeed Al Girgawi over there in the Red Shmar, who is a member of the strategic planning team and also a columnist on futurism and technology for Gulf News. In the middle, we have uh, Sara Amiri, who is deputy project manager and science lead. And to my left, we have Brahim. Uh, Hamza Al Qasmi, who is the head of the strategic research uh, section at the, at the uh, Space Center, as well as the deputy project manager for the strategic planning uh, for the HOPE uh, mission. Ons, can you roll the video, please? And dim the lights. Ibrahim, uh, inshallah, yes, <laughs> thank you, <laughs> thank you. Ibrahim is offering to act it out. I don't think that's a great idea. <laughs> In one minute? Okay, well, uh, might as well jump into this. So, um, so maybe one question, why 2020? Let's have, Misara, would you like to answer that? Why 2020? Um, 2020 actually has a lot of answers to that. Um, one is we need to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the UAE with, with a great impact, with a definition of what the UAE is really about and having a mission such as one that will go to Mars that has science involved in it, that has a lot of technology involved in it and also has a clear set message of hope um, to the wider Arab community, especially in these times, especially in the times of a lot of turmoil that is ongoing going um, is a message of what the UAE is truly really about and it defines what we are trying to do as a nation here in the region. Um, another one, another reason for 2020 is actually a physics reason. Uh, we can only launch to Mars once every two years and that occurrence happens um, in 2020 and then so it happens this year in 2016 and then again in 2018 and again in 2020 and 2022 and moving onwards. The reason for that is you don't want to waste a lot of fuel so you wait for Earth and Mars's orbits to get very close together and then you launch to space. And this is the opportunity that we found to launch in 2020 to get to Mars by 2021 which is the UAE's 50th anniversary year. Uh, another technical question, uh, when in 2020? So we're launching, video's coming up, launching in July of 2020 and we'll be there in about six to seven months in the first quarter of 2021. Okay, uh, Ons, are we good to go? Yeah, okay, well, dim the lights, please. Mars is a mysterious planet that has always fascinated people on Earth. We still have plenty of unanswered questions. For instance, we know there is water on Mars, but only in the form of ice and vapor. Water can't exist on Mars as liquid because the atmosphere has become too thin. Oxygen and hydrogen, the building blocks of water, are being lost into space. We also know that Mars has some exotic weather, like massive dust storms similar to those on Earth, which are more brief and localized. On Mars, the dust storms can engulf the entire planet and rage on for months. Our science mission is to produce the first ever truly global picture of the Martian atmosphere. This is the first holistic study of the Martian climate. 
and how the layers of its atmosphere fit together. We will model the connections between all the different components of the Martian climate, including all the temperatures, winds, dust, and clouds. Scientists on Earth will use the data that will be sent by the probe to build a complete dynamic picture of the Martian climate. This is something that has never been seen before. Our data will give the international science community a deeper and richer understanding of the Martian atmosphere. First, this will help us to model Earth's atmosphere and how it will evolve with time over millions of years. Second, it will allow us to analyze newly discovered planets far across the galaxy to be able to determine if there is life on it. We will share the data freely with more than 200 universities and research institutes around the world. This is our contribution to human knowledge. We want the orbiter to arrive at Mars in 2021, the UAE's 50th anniversary. Earth and Mars align their orbits once every two years. So we have a very short launch window in July 2020. We have to be ready by then. There will be no second chance. It's a race against time. The spacecraft will be launched in the nose cone of a rocket. The rocket must exceed 40,000 kilometers per hour to break out of Earth's gravity. The set of boosters and rocket stages will fire up and follow away in turn. It will fire its thrusters and accelerate to 100,000 kilometers per hour. Then the spacecraft will separate from the launcher. It will unfold the solar panels and point the spacecraft toward the sun to charge the batteries. The journey across the solar system will take around seven months. As it travels, the spacecraft needs to figure out its location. There is no GPS in deep space. So the spacecraft will use star trackers to navigate using patterns of constellations. This is similar to the way our ancestors used the stars to find their way in the desert and at sea. When the spacecraft gets close to Mars, it'll have to use its thrusters as brakes. It'll need to slow down to 14,000 kilometers per hour to enter orbit. This will be a tense time at mission control in the UAE. The thrusters must fire for 13 minutes at precisely the right time. If anything goes wrong, the spacecraft will pass Mars and the mission will fail. But we can't control the spacecraft in real time from Earth. When it's so far away, signals can take more than 14 minutes to arrive. Its brain will be sophisticated enough to make its own decisions. Look back in history. The Middle East was once a powerhouse for innovation and science. Muslim civilizations were once pioneers in mathematics and astronomy. This will be the first ever Arab Islamic mission to another planet. The Emirates Mars mission will have a major impact and a legacy here in the UAE. That's because of the approach that we took to planning and building this mission. The easy way to do it would have been to go and buy technologies and expertise from big space agencies and companies. We decided to do it ourselves, to build it ourselves, and to learn with our partners along the way. This mission is managed by a 100% Emirati team. Emirati universities and research institutions will work on the science. That way we get to build the knowledge and keep the skills. This mission will be the catalyst for a new generation of Arab scientists and engineers. It will be an anchor project for the space and science sector here in the UAE. That's one reason I'm so proud and excited to be part of the mission as an Emirati and as an Arab. It's very symbolic for an Arab and Muslim country to launch an interplanetary mission. We have taken a step beyond just looking at the skies. We are going there. I think it will change the way young people look at their region. It will help us think positively and see hope and opportunity. If a small young Arab nation is able to reach Mars, truly anything is possible. So this is a project that fires up the imagination. It's literally celestial. It's out of this world. 
And yet, what are the practical implications for the project in the UAE, Saeed, and the region? Practically, what does it mean here for the UAE? Uh, hi. Uh, well, it means that now we can, I mean, when you look at the region, we l seem to lack the scientific know-how. Uh, and what kicked off a lot of the tech that we use, for example, in the West, is directly linked to investments in space science and technology. Uh, during the Apollo era, there have been at least half a million engineers per year since then uh, that are coming out ever since these missions were uh, going on. So the practical reasons are that we'll get people inspired by this mission. Uh, they'll get to want to go to, sorry, to space to create things that we can use here to inspire the next generation on pro or possibly even try to work out a way to get this region going and getting it back to its glory days. Uh, Ibrahim, would you like to... Uh, I actually... I would add uh, something to that is... Um, well, space is a very, um, is a very ambitious field and, um, um, and our region is going through a, through a time uh, in which we, we seem very divided and very, um, uh, very intolerant to one another. And, and when you look at space, like uh, Sri said, it's, it's a very unifying and, and you know, out there, we're all just people of Earth. We've, we've, we, you know, we're not Emiratis and, and, and um, uh, Americans and, and uh, Europeans. And so it's, um, it's a very interesting domain. It does inspire young people to, to, to join STEM and, and to look for a better future, but it also is a very unifying and, uh, field. Sarah, do you have something to add about this? Um, I'll look from it from a development perspective. In terms of a development of any country, um, like Said said, this is a very inclusive um, field where, first off, it, dev it, de it develops a lot of the science and technology fields across the spectrum. Um, I'll also add, since we're here for Art Dubai, I'll add the art perspective into it. It also develops the thought and understanding and inspiration of science fiction, um, of imagining what the future will look like. And a lot of our future moving forward involves a lot of technology. It involves a lot of science, and it involves us getting out of this world. That's what we're all thinking about, what's beyond life here on Earth. Um, from an inspirational, so it promotes sustainable development not only in, in the classical fields that we all think about, but it promotes it in across the board, and that's where the inspiration and the name um, hope really resounds in, of what this mission is truly about. It's also a clear message of, the, of a vision, and the, the benefits of having a vision, and the benefits of having a long-term um, goal. In fact, the project is called Al Amal, in, uh, in Arabic, which is also one of the names of the commissioners here, Amal, congratulations. <laughs> so, um, the, the, something important was said uh, in the video, I think Ibrahim, uh, uh, someone mentioned it, about the uh, implications of this being a civilian project and not a military project. What does that mean? Why, why, is, why is it a big deal that this is a civilian? What differentiates the civilian project that you're working on then? All right, so if you're talking about a space program in the Middle East, everyone assumes you are building a weapon. Um, and no matter what you say, you're still building a weapon. Uh, and it's, um, to some extent, that, that does have uh, some truth to it, but um, like, <laughs> uh, but, if you focus on what we're actually, so, so Mohammed Barashi Space Center has been um, established actually next month, the 6th of February is our 10th anniversary. So we've, uh, we've existed for about 10 years and um, we have a lot of, uh, we're, we're a fairly young space program, but we do have a lot of heritage in space. And if you look at everything that we have developed to date, it was always focused on science, scientific development, scientific research. Um, the applications of, of the spacecrafts that we've de the, that are currently in space, by Sat one and by Sat 2 have, um, have been geared towards civilian and, and commercial um, uh, applications or even humanitarian missions. Um, so being, um, so investing in a, a field that people associate with, um, you know, having a, a dual use uh, purpose um, and, and dedicating it to, um, to expanding what we know about um, our solar system, about uh, Mars uh, and, and gearing it towards uh, a knowledge-based economy and, and development um, as opposed to the other thing 
uh, is very significant, and we are um, we are very uh, we've been doing that for ten years, and, and that's um, uh, we are very attached to, to that goal. Isn't it also the case that because it's a civilian project, uh, other countries and other organizations are more, uh, you know, um, open to dealing dealing with us? Well, absolutely. So, um, uh, know-how. So, a lot of these projects that we've 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 gotten into has, have been based on know-how tra transfer. So, uh, or capacity building, and um, and when you are transparent, and when you're when you're when your objectives are very clear, and um, and they're uh, they're civilian based, then then that um, that allows you a wider range for, for collaboration internationally. Um, Saeed, um, we, we men they mentioned in the, uh, in, the, in the video, I think, um, Sarah might have mentioned that this is an all Emirati team. W what's the significance of this being all Emirati? How many are you? Tell us a little bit about the team. Uh, where did you guys study? All right. So, so the, the very interesting part of it is that we are now about, so the whole space center is about 120. And out of those 120, approximately 80 are technical. And over 90% of them graduated from Emirati universities. So this tells you that we do have the capabilities here in our academic institutions that can allow people to actually build something and send it to space. So the, the, the knowledge is there is to just putting it all together in a coherent manner and in an effective manner that we can actually use it here. Uh, and the, you asked about what's so unique about Emira uh, being an all Emirati. Uh, one is we're trying to break stereotypes. We, Emiratis are always known as, uh, you know, they just they have the money, let someone else do it. <laughs> but we're we're trying to show the world that hey, you know what, we have the know-how, we have the capabilities to actually not just you know, specialize, but specialize, work together, and work internationally to, work, to do something that's greater, not just for the UAE, but for the whole region. And I guess that's what we're trying to do. Uh, I have a, maybe a follow-up to that. Was there a, sort of a, a cultural clash between Emiratis who studied here and Emiratis who studied abroad and came back? Or did you guys just work seamlessly together in this, on this project? I think that's by default. It just doesn't matter as long as I think uh, there's a culture clash between all Emiratis. Oh, okay. And, and, all Emiratis. I think what defines Emiratis. <laughs> okay. Uh, Sarah, since, this is, uh, since we are here in the Dubai Design District and it's really gorgeous, someone, someone here mentioned that it feels like a space colony where we are now. What do you guys think? I think, Ibrahim, you said that. Um, since we are in Dubai Design District, um, what are the design elements? How do you incorporate design in this project? Is design important to this, to this probe? Or is it more of uh, a practical uh, so, element? So design to engineers means something else. Design to engineers is actually going through the process of, of designing whatever probe or whatever electronics or whatever structure that you want to do to actually answer to the requirements or to answer to the clients. In this case, I think it's the UAE government and the scientific community. And it's about functionality. So it's about making things functional and how well it works. Um, versus design, I think, in the other realm where it's aesthetics and it's about creativity and it's about um, fulfilling a personal desire and a desire for the community. Um, what our designs are confined by is the physical realm, what is possible to do, what is not possible to design. We have some constraints to, to abide by other than um, the constraints imposed by the requirements that we have and we, what we need to deliver. And that's sort of a difference in design. But I think what you're asking is, does it have to be aesthetically pleasing? As long as it's functional, we're happy. So we don't design for, for aesthetic pleasure when we make spacecrafts and uh, when we make hardware, we design for functionality and we also design for, um, for efficiency and effectiveness along that. So we've got a lot of factors to play with. Um, cost is a big part of it and pleasing other people is also a huge part of that. So we know it's ugly. <laughs> uh, Saeed Ibrahim, do you want to say anything about design? Uh, well, for me, because I'm not, I don't, I, I don't come from a technical background. So when we first saw uh, the spacecraft, I just, I remember looking at it and go, wow, I thought it would be 
rounder for some reason. I don't know. But then I, I looked at I looked at Amran who was in the video, the project manager, and he looked at me, he just all he said was, We just need to put as much as we can in this tiny space or in a, in a small space and that's how they work for it. And another thing, cost is a big thing, so we don't have yes, we are in Dubai and you can see the beautiful skyscrapers, but we don't have that budget uh, for us to, to build to, or to, to build that spacecraft. So we have to be very cost effective, uh, regardless of what we actually see happening in Dubai. Maybe if you talk about, we brought some interesting, so to talk about how the structure of any satellite or spacecraft comes to be, um, we need to think of the launcher, the space environment. Um, launcher, basically, how we're going to fit it in and how much weight it can actually carry to space, how much it costs it to carry to space. How do I fit all the different wirings and all the different electronic boxes that go into a satellite in a very confined manner where it's all functional, it's all meant to be where it is, but it's very small and compact because that's going to reduce my launch cost. Um, and for example, safe and secure from the radiation that it, that it faces uh, in space. That's why I think it sometimes looks ugly, but it works. So, so I'm going to take questions from the from the floor, uh, maybe in a couple of minutes. So, if you guys have any uh, any questions, please uh, raise your hands. Uh, Ibrahim, uh, how difficult is this project from a logistical standpoint, and why is the UAE uniquely able to do this? Well, I don't know if the UAE is, is uniquely able to, to do it. I think um, a lot of countries have the capabilities to, to, to go to Mars, maybe not alone. But uh, I think we have, or the government of the UAE has invested in, in this field for 10 years. And, and um, um, I think we are in a position uh, in which this mission is, is, is challenging, is very challenging. Uh, but inshallah, we'll be able to, to, to achieve it. Uh, but... Um, uh, so how hard is it logistically? It's um, it's a very challenging mission because our teams are scattered all across the UAE. I remember one of our earlier uh, video conferences. I think we had people in four different cities. Uh, four, four, yeah, four different different times. So we had someone in, in Dubai and someone that was in Europe and someone on was on the west coast uh, of, and poor Hill was in Korea. It was two a.m. in the morning. So um, so it's um, it's it's. Well, there you go. Um, and it was so. It's uh, and the mission itself. It's we're trying to build something that can withstand, you know, in, in you know, an explo a controlled explosion, um, and then launch into space and operate in a very harsh environment and get inserted in the right um, orbit around a planet that's millions of uh, tens of millions of kilometers away. So, it's uh, it's it's challenging. But uh, before I take a question from the from the uh, audience. Um, do we have any uh, feel for numbers here? Of numbers. Oh. <laughs> how how expensive is this project? No. Um, <laughs> well, we don't have the. I, I don't think we, 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 we can come out with the exact okay. budget number okay. yet. But, <laughs> okay. but, but it's there. But it's there. It's, it's, up, it's way up we, there. We no, it's not way up there. Okay. So no. it's it, one of the one of the government requirements that we had is that this has to be a very cost effective mission. We did not have from the get go a an open budget, and we were told to do this in a very cost constrained manner. Inshallah, if we manage to deliver it, it will be a new way of of of. First off, uh, a new way of managing such projects because we were following things that were best fit to what we require rather than, than um, following things that have already been precast for other entities. So we take the best out of other standards that are out there, but we customize it to what we need. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And same thing with the, with the spacecraft development. We are trying to do the best with what current technologies are there because we have a short amount of time. For example, we're using science instruments that have already flown to Mars because it's been designed before, it's cheaper therefore to, to, to design it better, um, but we've made innovations in terms of how the orbit is around Mars, therefore we can get new science with the same instruments and that's a lot of the design decisions that we take into consideration while developing the mission to keep the costs very low. So it's not a rocket high um, figure that we're used to hear from other space programs. Okay, I'll ask you about patents uh, in a minute. Um, um, I'll take one, one question maybe from the, from the audience, if anybody has a, a, a question. Try to make it a bit more uh, interactive. Anyone? Question, not statement. Yes, it's a question. Uh, first of all, thank you very much uh, for the presentation. And I want to applaud you for your efforts. I think this is something very great. 
Uh, one question is uh, regarding that your decision to have this 100% local Emirati, uh, you know, like input of know-how. I'm just wondering what were the challenges that you faced with this because you have to please a lot of stakeholders with this. And, um, and also, you know, given that perhaps that this kind of project was not present or not, um, um, for example, initiated in this region. So how were you able to kind of uh, convince the stakeholders and what are the main challenges you faced with kind of really coming up? Thank you. Wait, was it that this project wasn't initiated in this region? I'll, I'll, I'll repeat your Sorry, question. Yeah. Um, was it challenging to only s source it from Emirati team? Very challenging. Um, very challenging. Yeah, so okay. recruiting for, for space programs is, is already a very difficult thing. Finding the right talent and skills um, is hard, and so when you limit yourself to um, a population, then it's, it's hard. We are in the, in, the, in the business of building capacity for the UAE in, in this sector um, in order to develop a more um, uh, resilient, knowledge-based economy. So that is why our, in, in this phase this is our focus, uh, but it, it certainly is, is a challenging uh, uh, limitation. Um. I want to, uh, Ons, can we play the, the, the video uh, in, a, in a minute? I ask my question first. Uh, so, Saeed, uh, so, uh, what is the language of communication here? So, we're speaking in English, we're in Dubai, uh, it's an international city, it's a global city. Um, when you guys, uh, you know, you, you realize that a lot of the literature has been published in English. A lot of the science and know-how is available in English. How important is Arabic? And how, how often do you use Arabic? And what are you doing to further the knowledge of, uh, of, of Arabic, uh, maybe uh, in science, space science? Well, we're trying to, to mix it, to, to try to keep a balance between Arabic and English. But since this is a, a mission that is catered to you know, building hope and for it to be a catalyst for the region to start investing in science and technology and for even people to be aware that, hey, you know, you, you can go to science and technology or you can become an extremist that's hated by, si by, by everyone. So it's either, we we're giving you this option. You want to go to the venture to the stars or, yeah. Uh, but, but what we're trying to do is, the, the issue that we're facing a lot is a lot of the terminology is in English. And we have to sort of, I don't, sort of create and innovate a new way of getting this Try getting this lingo, this technical lingo, and Arabizing it in a very understandable way. Uh, so we recently, about a month ago, uh, launched uh, Al Misbar Show, which is a social media platform uh, that provides. Oh, hi. Uh, that uh, yeah. So it provides a lot of the simple questions that we see uh, every day. Uh, because as of today, there are 30,000 technologies that we use currently on a daily basis that have direct, re the direct relations to uh, space science and technology. So we want to get, get everyone in the Arab world to start thinking, all right, so I didn't know that a touch screen was uh, directly related to space. I didn't know that MRI was actually used for to study stars, and then someone just smart engineer just went and pointed it at a person and hey we can look at the inside of people so we want to get basically we want to get space we want to get the universe and science to the general public of the Arab world so the Al Misbar is that platform where we ask very basic questions all right what will happen if the earth stops spinning and then we try to try to make it as simple as possible yet as technical and valid that you know, people can actually discuss this, argue this. Teachers can use this uh, as a teaching tool uh, in their classes to discuss. Okay, what can happen? How can you think beyond what we what we know, and how you can take it forward? So we're going to watch uh, a minute, exactly 60 seconds of this uh, video, and then I have a follow-up question. So this is Al Misbar, launched in December. Hmm. تعودنا ان نسمع كلمة ساتلايت يوم اهالينا يحبون يغيرون من ام بي سي اثنين لقناة دبي ويقولون اقول لك بدل على نال سات ولا على عرب سات او يمكن نشوف الساتلايت في الافلام يوم الاشرار يستخدمونها لاطلاق الليزر على الطال
لكن الاقمال الاصطناعيه هي اكثر بكثير من مجرد اشارات التلفزيون ولها الكثير من الفوائد اللي تاثر على حياتنا اليوميه ومو بس مجرد جزء من فيلم خيالي الصور المستخدمه في خرائط جوجل ياخذونها من خلال الاقمال الاصطناعيه تنبؤ بحاله الطقس المكالمات التليفونيه يوم تكونوا على الطياره تحديد المواقع الجي بي اس في السياره وفي التليفون وطبعا الكثير من البحوث العلميه في الفضاء والزلازل ورصد التلوث والى اخره كلها تعتمد على الساتلايت فشو حجمه كم عدد الاقمال الاصطناعيه في الفضاء وشو اللي يصير بالجديمه منها اذا سالت شخص ما هو حجم الاقمال الاصطناعيه يمكن يعتقدون ان حجم مركبة فضائية كبيرة او صاروخ هذا كله بسبب الافلام انت شو رايك ثانك يو سو سو از يو سو اتس اي اتس اتس ا بروجرام هاو لونج از ات اباوت سو سو ايتش ابيسود از وان وير وات وير دوين ناو از جست اكسبيرمنتينج بات اون افريج اتس بتوين 4 تو 6 مينيتس سو اتس كور اوف بايت سايز ذات يو انفيجن teachers parents yeah. maybe uh, students yeah. for me watching for it. me a criteria of success is a teacher you know they don't or they want to try to get science or, or something technical into their classrooms and they don't know how and they use this as as a starting point and then they have their uh, their students coming up with uh, ideas because some of the f- uh, episodes that we have in mind are actually experiment based mm-hmm. and we want to see hey we're doing this experiment this is our hypothesis how can we get the scientific method to be applied uh, by the students on their daily basis so they get to share with us and that's the and we have it in arabic because uh, we have it in arabic because we don't have anything like this in arabic un- unfortunately so we want to have and for us even we're starting to see a lot of awareness towards science uh, and technology so but w- we don't see that engagement and so that's what we're trying to uh, to do okay the but we but yeah. we're sorry to but we're trying to we're going to add uh, english subtitles for to to for those who are educated in english terminology to start using arabic t- terminology I was just going to add, like Zaid said, we are not that experimenting, uh, experimentation uh, phase of it, so we're really trying uh, different material and different uh, topics. And it's, it's meant to be a very interactive um, uh, series, so uh, you, you can definitely go online and interact and actually choose the next topic that we, uh, we discuss. Um, terminology, words. Um, how, do we, how do we translate these words into Arabic? Are there words? I mean, what, what you mentioned, I think, in the, in the video that the Middle East and the Islamic world were pioneers, uh, you know, and uh, are we using the words from the, from the olden days or are there new words now? Are we using the words? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, if you look, think of it from this aspect, two-thirds of all stars that have names have Arabic names. So, that, uh, so this tells you a lot. Uh, for me, a funny one is alcohol. Alcohol is an Arabic word, yet Muslims cannot <laughs> consume it. So it's a, it's a paradox. Wait, is there a star called alcohol? <laughs> no, <laughs> the alcohol. Is, no, but a lot of those stars, but a lot of those stars have have very, uh, very literal names, and they're being used every day uh, in English or in the scientific scientific community without without knowledge. Of it, so Sarah. So that actually reflects where the Arab Golden Age actually soared in. So you've got a lot of Arabic terminology in mathematics, in astronomy. Um, I read somewhere, but I still haven't verified it, that one of the first people to start merging between astronomy, so looking at the stars and mathematics, were Arab um, scientists back in the day because they were trying to figure out what's the right angle for them to start praying. And that's where they started developing the entire concept of merging math with astronomy, which is the modern astrophysics. Um, But in terms in more modern technology, we don't have a lot of words in Arabic. And we struggle a lot because we have to present it. So we work and do everything in English, but then we have to present in Arabic. And that's a huge problem for us. You should see the, the nights that we don't sleep when someone tells us, oh, you have a presentation in Arabic to explain a technical perspective. Or, I think. or send me an email in Arabic. <laughs> that never happens. So if anyone asks us to send them an email in Arabic, that will never get to you. Um, and there we've noticed that a single word in, Arabic, in English, we have to translate into an entire, into entire sentence 
in Arabic to actually explain what it is. Our, our toughest one was reaction wheel. So we use reaction wheels on, on satellites. What's the translation in Arabic, Brahim? Nizam, um, what was it? Nizam Tawjih al Qamar al Sanai. And it's not even that, by the way. Yeah. It's not, it's not, it's not it's even, not, it describes what it does. It des- describes but, the system, but yeah. the subsystem, but not. Exactly, it's but it doesn't. Something like dis- this. Because I had to talk <laughs> about it once, yeah. I <laughs> know, yeah, that's why I asked you. <laughs> oh, and then say passive attitude control system. Yes. That's even. <laughs> So attitude is not the at- so it means the attitude of the satellite yeah. and how it's acting in space and we use that a lot to say how what direction does the satellite maneuver around Earth and try explaining that in Arabic I can barely explain it in English Google Translate is hilarious it really is very funny for these words and we all have the Google Translate app on our phones requirement huh so um, any question from the from the floor. Last chance. <laughs> I, can't, I actually can't see there's a question. Yes. yes. Um, okay. You're talking about the Arabic um, words. Are you thinking of putting these words in Arabic, maybe like to start writing stories for kids so they know more about space in Arabic? So in, in that way, have you thought about this idea? I think I'll answer that question for you guys. This is an invitation <laughs> from, from everybody here for the artistic community to start writing books for kids and hopefully incorporate, uh, you know, uh, celestial uh, names in them. Right, Ibrahim? Yes, please. Absolutely. Okay. So uh, I I have a question for you guys. Um, You guys, I mean, some of you guys met Buzz Aldrin. So how was the meeting and what was his advice and and who is he? All right. So (laughs) why everyone's laughing, I guess you know who Buzz Aldrin. So Buzz Aldrin... um, Oh, that's a good question. That's a good question. Who, so who, who knows or who doesn't know who Buzz Aldrin who is? Bo- Buzz Let's see. Who knows? Put your hand so up. Raise your hand. Yeah. All right. You'll be quizzed, by the way. Yeah, so it's an artistic <laughs> community. I would say 30%. Okay. okay. So Buzz Aldrin is the second human being to set foot on, on the moon. Uh, he was in, that, in the first Apollo mission to, um, uh, with, with Neil. Uh, Apollo Armstrong. mission to land. To land on, on the moon. Oh, that's a very good point. Uh, and he, 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 he was here in the UAE a while back um, and, and spoke about his experience uh, with, with the Apollo mission uh, and what it felt uh, or how, you know, how, how the journey to, to the moon and back uh, felt like. Um, Buzz, I had to concentrate not to say Buzz, all, uh, Buzz Lightyear. Um, but he... Uh, <laughs> and the, and it was named after him, just in case anybody... The Toy so, Story character. Yeah, the Toy Story character was named after Buzz Aldrin. But he's really... Um, Buzz Aldrin is really pushing for more uh, funding for Mars missions. He's really an advocate for exploring Mars. And... and, um, and uh, I'm talking about his uh, shirts. He gave us a shirt. Well, he sent it to you, so you should so talk he sent, about it. So he was here, and, um, we met him, and, and, and we, uh, he spoke in uh, Sheikh Hamad bin Zayed uh, Majlis uh, just before Ramadan, and, uh, and then he went back home and sent us a box of shirts that says, get your butt to Mars. Um, and then there are different variations of the shirt. What was his advice? <laughs> Sarah, Saeed, what was his advice to you guys? Did he give you any advice, or was it just a friendly meeting? Just as his said, his shirt said, yeah. get your butt to Mars. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I have uh, an, another question here since um, this is a general question, but maybe Saeed and Sarah, how have you guys at the uh, Space Center engaged with the community? Have you arranged visits for students? Can people visit you guys? Are you guys off limits? Will we, you know, will you... You know, if people approach the building... We're civilian. Yes, civilian, of course. So how have you engaged with the community in Dubai and the UAE? Uh, so what we've been doing is we, we want to do... Unfortunately, we're such a small team, our outreach team, that we want to do uh, a lot of big impact uh, events. So we try to do... We did a workshop for teachers where we teach the teachers how to incorporate science, space science, technology, and all of that, from activities to presentations to just discussions in their curriculum. So they don't have to actually go about their way and do the extra mile and try to change the curriculum. We just look at the curriculum, tell them, by the way, in here you can add this part. In here you can talk about this. And they go, oh, okay, then we can do this. And it was nice that we got to uh, 
we got to have them contribute as well. So it wasn't just us telling them, hey, do this, 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 this. It was them, they're like, oh, why don't you guys think of this? Oh, that's nice, all right. And so there was this dialogue between us and the teachers. And so during uh, a week, we, throughout the UAE, we, uh, we had about 100 and almost 150 teachers. So if you do the math, each teacher, 40 students, 30 students, uh, so around 8,000 students just by doing this uh, workshop. And it was one of these first types of workshops that we've been experimenting with, and we've seen a lot of success with it. Uh, so there'll be a lot of those coming up in the coming years. Uh, we've done a lot of uh, school visits. Uh, we have some students or some schools that come over uh, to the space center and look at our guys in the clean rooms and whatnot. Uh, but we are we do welcome more ideas. Uh, unfortunately, because of our n small number, we can't do much. Uh, so we want more ideas, we want people to engage us and tell us what to do, or tell us how to contribute better. Not everything works, but what does? Sarah. It will also be very good. So, um, Say so just mentioned a number, which is about 8,500 students from various, I think from middle school all the way till universities that we've impacted in the space of six months, and with a team of only six people. Um, and. What we're trying to look at is smaller pockets within the community without our interference, because this is what the mission is about. It's, it's a message of hope for everybody. It's a message of inspiration to everybody. So for people to pick up the idea of this, of this project and to start implementing it in various facets. So um, we always look at, we don't have to be, so you don't have to be directly stated to be members of the team with a particular role um, as citizens and as members of the community. It's really great to, when we see people that are inspired by, why, by what we're doing and they come and say, because we saw um, what you guys are doing and the, the, the inspiration and you've inspired us to, um, to do so and so and we've got a lot of examples of that and that's what the kind of impact that we're looking for uh, from this mission. Uh, is there anything you want to say? Uh, no, I think you guys have covered it. Yeah, yeah sure. there's a question here in front. Maybe we get a maybe we get a mic. We can hear you. All. Okay, ask your question and I'll repeat it. But question, not a statement. How you develop the skill of team? Okay, uh, the question is, uh, how did you develop the skills of the team? A uh, very good question. Uh, so, uh, since the beginning, our concentration was on programs uh, or joint ventures uh, in, in capacity building. So, DubaiSat 1 was a learning, was the, our very first lesson um, in the field. DubaiSat 2 uh, was a continuation of that. And, and now, our third Earth Observation Satellite do, is doing, um, is, is the final phase in terms of, of capacity building. But we're also, um, we also initiated the first uh, uh, CubeSat mission in the UAE, and CubeSats are meant to be an educational tool, and it's uh, seven uh, Emirati engineering students from the American University of Sharjah um, have, have designed, developed, uh, tested, uh, and assembled uh, the um, uh, Knife One, and it's now in a pea pod waiting to get launched on the next Falcon 9 mission. Um, I don't know, does that answer? There's another aspect to you guys. You guys actually have already started uh, a number of projects. Uh, I think Dubai Sat 1, Dubai Sat 2, and the upcoming Khalifa Sat. How have they been used? Um, that how have they been used uh, to to uh, you know impact the people here, the, the uh, practically on the ground in Dubai? How have they been used? These three uh, projects. So Dubai Sat 1 and 2 had um, have had a lot of applications in terms of monitoring the the different developments uh, and projects in in Dubai at uh, Al Maktoum International Airport. We've also um, We've done a lot of environmental um, uh, uh, not uh, studies around desalination centers around the UAE. Um, I remember one of my first memories when I joined uh, MBRSC, or at the time EAST, um, was that we were talking about the floods that hit Pakistan in 2010. And, and the team, and, and so we're, we represent the UAE in a, a platform uh, called UN Spider. And it's a platform that anyone with uh, an Earth observation uh, satellite can can upload images of of regions that were struck by natural disasters. Uh, and so we were using Dubai Sat One to try and image these areas and upload them to that website to help relief efforts. 
Um, so I, I, that's stood out because now we're contributing. The, the UAE has always been a contributor to, uh, you know, in terms of, of, of relief and, and disaster uh, support. And, and now we're doing it through um, our space assets, ones that we've developed. Um, so um, we have a question from Shumon. Yeah. Um, in the last few years, we've, uh, we've, been, we've literally been able to witness the surface of Mars through the recent... Uh, mission and, and it's as though the Mars rover uh, was Wally. Uh, we, we kind of developed a, 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 a very personal, intimate relationship and felt every jolt, uh, every battery death that uh, he or she or it experienced. In in 2020, NASA is also la launching another um, Mars mission called Mars 2020. I'm just wondering how uh, your mission. Um, and also, in particular, the kind of scientific experiments that you may be planning to do, you know, coordinate with, the pre with, with this history, culture, and ecology of, because obviously you're not the only ones doing this. There are many, um, there are several uh, uh, initiatives. Um, so is there, yeah, what, what, how is that coordination work? And, and how does your uh, attempt to, to um, you know, initiate new scientific experiments. In, in a way, it's interesting because it's five years away and presumably science will move on in that time. So there's, there's a sense in which, you know, there's a kind of moving target. So I'm just, it's very interesting because it brings space, time and knowledge all together, literally in a celestial way. So in particular, how do, how, how do these initi individual initiatives kind of coordinate with each other, if they do at all? Um, and, and how do we, how do you ensure that the, the research that you try and do in a way isn't redundant is, a, is an obvious word, but isn't redundant because everyone else is doing the same thing. So our target with this mission, number one, I think, government um, requirement that was imposed on the entire team is to have novel science. So to collect data that will enable us to answer science questions that scientists have posed before, but they haven't had an instrument that is currently in development or that is being thought of, that is going to Mars and provide them with the necessary data they require to analyze, to answer those questions. So the first thing we did is to go back to the science community. Usually these missions are directly um, instigated by scientists. Uh, they're the ones that set the questions, they're the ones that set the requirements and say what they really need to understand about the planet to further their knowledge of the development of that planet that's very similar to ours. Um, and one consortium that has been started by NASA, but there's a lot of scientists, planetary scientists and Mars planetary scientists that are members of that, is MEPAG. And what MEPAG does is on a yearly basis update the list of science questions that it requires to be answered and also update the list of science questions that are currently being answered by, by some missions. And we use that quite, we use that to sort of guide us towards what the science community needs, needs right now. We also looked at the different missions that have been ongoing up to date, including, so not the 2020 mission, because our objective is different, but the missions that happened prior to ours, to see where is the focused interest of the Mars science community. And we made sure that the new data that we're getting is very complementary to the science of the mission. Oh, sorry, the science of Mars. I have very two quick questions. Um, what's the gender balance in this uh, program? 50-50. Exactly. The center with 50-50. 50-50, okay. Um, and last question uh, is, how do we engage the artistic community? Not just the artists, but, uh, but you know, writers, um, critics, designers, people, you know, th th these guys and girls in front of us here. So how do we engage them and, and other people? Have we engaged them? And how can we well, engage them better? I don't think we've engaged them as much as we, we would have liked to. Um, and I think uh, the art community in, in Dubai plays a, a critical role in, in our mission because we are meant to inspire and, and no other, I think, no better medium is, exists um, um, to, to, to do that. Um, and I do hope we interact maybe later on tonight and see if there, and I love the question um, um, and the homework that you gave to, to the lady that asked the question. Uh, and I really, hope, I really hope that we can somehow bring you closer to the mission and have you uh, support us um, in education and outreach and in our efforts to inspire the region. Saeed Sarah, do you have anything to add to that? No, I just, for me, I just thought of that it would be really nice 
for a writer or an, an artist to work on a piece that looks at uh, this, the effects of this mission a century from now and just mm. whatever pops in their head and how this mission can trickle down to society from politics to culture to even food and, uh, and just work, go crazy with it. You're a columnist. Would you be uh, open to writing maybe something with someone on, on this field? Definitely. Okay. So the or writers out there, if you guys want to collaborate with the Saeed, maybe on an know. article. This is an invitation from my side. Um, th thank you very much, uh, Saeed al Girgawi, uh, Ibrahim uh, al Qasmi, and Sarah Amiri for joining me here. Please uh, make your way down, and I will uh, introduce the next panel. Thank, thank you, you, sir. Thank you. Thank you.